talked about what's happened in the Supreme Court, some of the cool decisions that have come down. Let me know God's starting to turn things around. Regardless of, uh, uh, of what they say on the news, we don't need to be listening to that news, really, you know. But uh, we need to be listening to the good news, and we need to hear from God. And so uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me this week, and he said, just build on last week. But it's going to be a little different. Uh, but it's, we're going to talk about freedom. Is that okay? Yeah. How many know the, the Bible says for freedom you've been set free? Yeah. Right? Okay. So anyway, we're ready to go. Let me, uh, we're going to read the, uh, let's read, uh, we'll have it up there. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 and 39. And I say the word tells us we are debtors to share the gospel with people even if they don't receive it, all right? So let's see what it says. It says, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Ah. <laughs> check out what it says, and we're not going to do it now, but check out what it says in Mark. I mean, no, Jesus, he loved to use the, sh the shock value sometimes. <laughs> love <it>. <laughs> he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow me, uh, follow after me is not worthy of me. Cross is the, the thing God's given to you, your ministry. All right? And we need to take it up every day. And what, what if people reject me? Well, they will. That's why it's the cross, right? But you're not doing it for yourself, but you're doing it as unto the Lord. Okay, And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. How many vote for the latter? Amen. Right? Right. How many are ready to, to do, if he gives you the grace to do it, and he will, how many of you are ready to follow him wherever he takes you? Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the right answer. That's the right answer. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. In just a minute. So we owe people the opportunity for the power of God to change them. And it's only the power of God that will change them. Let's look at Acts 10, 42 through 44. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it, it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. Yes. You know, Peter had an argument with God because of food, right? Oh, we don't deal with it. We don't deal with the Gentiles, man. They got a different diet than we do. Remember that scripture over in Acts? You know, I love God because he just, he just kind of ignores you, you know. <laughs> he says, go and do what I told you, right? <laughs> I will confirm the word. And so he confirmed it beautifully, and it opened the doors for the Gentiles to be saved. And it was just the start. It was just the beginning. And so I'm looking at you, and, and we, we owe Peter a debt, but mainly we owe the Lord because of what he's done. And uh, it's, these are exciting days. Um, one of the guys that God had called me into the ministry, I didn't realize all that it would entail. I had a good friend in college. Uh, I didn't think anything would amount to, he would amount to anything, really. Because, yeah, I gotta tell you this story. We went to Wittenberg University. He was like 6'3", 6'4", about 220 pounds. You wouldn't wanna mess with a guy, right? And we had to wear these beanies. We decided, I don't think we're gonna wear them, you know? Because they would, the upper class would come by and paint your nose green or try to if you didn't have these beanies on, right? So my friend John and I, you know, we used to hang out and go to class together. And uh, he'd say, Dave, what do you say we just ditched the beanies today? Well, we got, we got stopped a few times by people and went, where's your beanie? He says, uh, we're not wearing them. You got an issue with that? Come on. Well, they went, see you. <laughs> see you later. But John, he was a tough dude, and eventually he flunked out of school, 
uh, I remember taking him home uh, for Thanksgiving, dropping him off at his house in Madison, New Jersey, and his parents, they were, oh, thank you, Dave, for bringing him home from Ohio. And we talked for a little bit. And uh, the, the parents say, well, what, what do you, John, he's still making up his mind what he's supposed to do with his life. What, what, is, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I'm going to serve God. I, I, I have a calling on my life. I, I, I knew it by that time. And they, usually you think adults are going to be pretty nice to you. <laughs> they weren't. They said, get out of here. It's not like, oh, get out of here. No, no, get out of here. You know, you fool. That's what they told me. You stupid fool. Thanks for encouragement, guys. <laughs> I mean, you got to have a little sense of humor going on. you got to have, you know. And John's looking at me like, I apologize, Dave. I apologize, Dave. But you know what? And I, had no, I, I did not hear from him for years. One year ago, I, I got a phone call from him. He said, do you remember me? I said, of course I remember. He said, well, i got to tell you. He said, I've been in the Vietnam War. I've got a, he said, I've been promoted in the military, a high rank. He said, I think he had several silver stars. And uh, he said, you know, I, I want you to know that I'm plugged in with the Lord. Wow. And so I just felt God wanted me to call you and tell you thank you, you know. After all those years, I went, wow. Well, I'm glad you made it through the war and all that other stuff. You know, and your parent, no, I didn't say that. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but you never know. I had another guy in college. His, name was, his first name was Lance. And he was a married guy. He was in the military as well. And he and I, uh, we were in the same fraternity. He was a, he was a, uh, a senior when I was a freshman. And we, we were poker buddies. We used to play a lot of poker. And uh, he was like a partner, you know. And I said, Brother Dave, what were you doing back in those days? Uh, how, how many of you have had a dramatic conversion? Huh? Well, I had one, big time. Where people, we, we don't believe this. Uh, really, it really happened to you. You were such a jerk. You were, you were an evil guy. We, I just, but how many know, but God? Everybody say, but God. And so I, I was telling, uh, well, Ina and I were downtown with Michael Green and his, his family, and we were down in the French Quarter. We were showing Ina the French Quarter and all that. And uh, Ina and I, were, we weren't quite married. We were engaged. Uh, we were a month or two off from being married. And so all of a sudden, this guy comes bounding down the street. I think we were in Bourbon Street, one of those places. And Michael Green, who was over right next to me, looks over like, who is this guy? He's coming right at us. Like, he, he, he's going to jump on us. And uh, I told him, I said, it's a good thing you didn't hit him or anything. I said, he was Green Beret. I said, you, you just a good thing, you know. So he comes up, Dave Newell, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm living here now. And this is my fiance. Well, he said, you, you have to come and have dinner with my wife and I. When can you, can you come on Friday or whatever it was? I said, yeah, we'll just give us the address. We'll be there, you know. So I and I show up. We had a nice meal. Until, everybody say until. Until. He said, because we were talking, you know, uh, about our past and all that kind of stuff. You know. But then he says, well, what are you doing here? And. How did you guys meet each other and everything? I said, well, we are actually pastors now. I said, we're not married yet, but I said, we're close to it, and, and that's what she's going to be, and that's what I am, and I've been in the ministry now for about a year here in New Orleans. Total change in the environment. You know, just, whoa. And, I got, and he said, you're going to have to leave. You, you, you're going to have to leave. He said, you fool. And he looked at Ina and he said, he, I know him. He said, I know this guy. He said, he probably brainwashed you. She said, no, I, I was saved before he was. Yay, Ina. 
And she said, I was filled with the Holy Ghost a year before. Yeah, Anna. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're being polite. <laughs> he did. He said, get out. Okay. <laughs> How many know you, you win some, you lose some, right? I mean, it's just the way it is. And, but you have to be willing to put the relationship that you have with Jesus as number one. Number one, you will be tested in I guarantee. As the man said in the South, I guarantee. Right? So these are, and you know, I never heard from Lance after that, like I did John. But you, you just don't know. You, you let your light shine, and you do what you have to do, and leave the rest up to the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. But you have to put God first. You know, I, I have to say, since I put my hand in the plow, I never turned back. This is my 57th year serving God. I started at three years old. No, I was. <laughs> but I don't regret a thing, especially as I get older. Whew. And I thank God for that lady. Wow. Couldn't have done it without her. Wow. Okay. Number two. God's love for us is stronger than our fear of rejection. I love the scripture in 2 Timothy 1.7. Let's, let's just take a look at it. Here we get it. We be getting it. There we go. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and a sound mind. Say, that's me. That's a great life verse, by the way. That's a great three-point sermon, by the way. We're not going to go there, but God has not given, say, God has not given me the spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So, yeah, there's going to be rejection, but who cares? <clears throat> In light of eternity, doesn't matter. So God's love for us is stronger than our fear of rejection, found in 2 Timothy 1.7, his love. It is only when we know the truth and continue in the truth are we his disciples. John 8, 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed uh, him, if you abide in me, that, that means you, you remain in me. If you, if you abide in, me, uh, in my word, you are my disciples indeed. I mean, no, he says his word. Everybody say his word. his word. The Bible says God puts the word above his name. That's heavy. We'll talk about that in a little bit, I guess. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But it's, it's as we abide, it's as, it's as we continue. How many of you have found that in your walk with the Lord, as you've continued in him, certain things that you believed at one time, you don't believe anymore, and they just kind of dropped off you, right? And the Holy Spirit graciously has done that for us, right? And so, uh, but, we, but we always, we need to really have the, the word, the truth of God in our hearts. Lean over and tell your neighbor he's talking to you. We need to have the word in our hearts so that we can give an answer to people when we talk to them, right? Uh, I got a phone call. This is years and years ago when I was in New Orleans and got a phone call from uh, my dad. And he said, you expect a call from this man. And he told me his name. He said he's a good friend of mine. And he's concerned about a young man that's actually living in New Orleans and uh, he, he wants you to hook up with this young man. And so I said, sure. So I got a call the next day from this guy. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about him. He said, he's, uh, uh, he's a student in Tulane. I guess he's very, doing very well. But um, he, doesn't, he doesn't know the Lord. Uh, I've talked to him a little bit about the Lord before he left for school. And uh, he didn't make any comments. And... He said, I, it would be wonderful if you could reach out to him. And he gave me his name and telephone number, and I called the young man, and, 
He sa I said, hey, how would you like, are you free Saturday? We'll go out and get a, some lunch and uh, my treat. And he said, yeah, I can do that. I said, uh, where would you like to meet near your school? And he told me. So I met him for lunch on, on uh, that Saturday. And we had a really good fellowship. We had a really good time. And we talked. And then I gave him my testimony. Told him what had happened in my life. And he, he, he was very polite, and he listened to me. And he said to me, well, that's good for you. But he said, see, I don't really need God. He said, see, I've got full scholarship. Four years. Like, I'm a smart man. You know? And, but he said, you know, so I've got, he said, I've got everything I need. I've got the finances. To, I, I'm, I have a full ride here. And, but I appreciate you taking time to share with me. But uh, I said, I'm going to make a commitment to you. Something rose up on the inside of me, man. Yeah. Something rose up, and I said, I'm going to make a real commitment to you. And he said, yeah, what is it? You know. <laughs> <coughs> I said, I'm going to pray that God will remove all that stuff. Take away the thing that's hindering you from coming to Christ. You know, you're depending on your finances and, and your full ride and all that kind of thing for four years. But I said, what if that was removed? If God knew that by the removal of it, you would now be open to the gospel. He said, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> I said, bro, I am committed. Have a good day. I got your name. I know exactly how to pray for you. And it's no mistake that we had a good meeting here today. Please don't. I said, love you. Bless you. <laughs> so did you pray? Yeah, I, I prayed God would remove that. Never heard from him, but hey. Okay. <laughs> Number three, our testimony should include the full gospel's impact on our lives. Not only the forgiveness of sins by the blood of Jesus, all right, but healing, that's the filling, healing for our body. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you what? Past tense, you were healed. Tell your neighbor, you were healed. Whatever it is you're going through, you were healed already. Praise God. That's got to be our testimony. We have to agree with the Holy Spirit. We have to agree with the Word of God, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, tell your neighbor, I'm dead to sin. It's by his blood. Might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Okay, so uh, there's healing for the body. Um, and I'm going to go and, and look at a few of these other uh, scriptures also. There's redemption from poverty. I love that. Uh, but it's not just salvation uh, of your soul, of your spirit, but it's also uh, healing for your body. Uh, I got thinking about this when I was preparing for the message. Years ago, it was when we came to the city to plant the church. The Lord gave me an opportunity. There was, um, I want to see how I want to phrase this. In 1997, when we came here, I got a phone call. We came here actually to, we, we met in, I think it was the Holiday Inn over in, in the Durham area. We, that's where we met. And we just put the word out. Tim, Paula Pritchard were uh, one of the first people here that met with us. And there turned out to be about 30 people at this meeting. And it just worked perfectly because in, that was in, that was in uh, when was that? I know, was it July? I think it was July of 97. June or July, one of those. No, June. It was in June. And uh, so I got, a phone, I got a phone call from Guidepost Magazine. This was in, I think, 
uh, February of 97, a few months before we came down here. We knew we were going to be coming down here. We, we had that, that clear enough direction at that particular time. And so I got a phone call from this guy from uh, Guidepost, and he said, I want to call you to check on a testimony that we're going to probably publish in our May issue of Guidepost. He said, do you remember a fellow named David Westerfield? And I went, yes. He claims that you pastored him for a couple of years in uh, Shreveport. I said, yep. And uh, he said, well, he claims that he submitted an article to us saying that you had come to pray for him. Um, and actually, Ida and I had gone to pray for him many times. But he had, I would say it was like cancer of the brain where he was so sick he couldn't even sit up. He, all he could do is lay down. So when we saw him in the hospital, th that's what happened. That's the way he was. He was a uh, feature writer for the Shreveport Times. That was his job. And the guy said, um, he submitted this article that said, you came into his room and laid hands on him and he was healed. <laughs> did that happen? I said, yeah, yeah, it, it did happen. Exactly happened. He said, well, we want to publish his article in the May issue, Guidepost. And I said, okay, would you send me a lot of them? How many would you like, sir? <laughs> At least 30. It was that guy's testimony that literally helped birth the church. Because, you know, they didn't know us from Adam when we came in. We, were, we did a series on learning here from God and we came twice, and I think the first time we came, we came with these, you know, these m magazines, these small little magazines, guideposts, and his article was in there, and we gave them out to everybody, just to let them know, hey, we're, we, you know, we're not just fly-by-nighters. This is it. We actually pastored. This actually happened, and God can do this for you, and so th that literally opened the door for the birth of this place. The, it was the healing testimony because we believe that God still heals today, you know? And how many do as well? You all absolutely do. So uh, that was pretty cool. We, we really thought that was uh, a neat thing that happened. And then redemption from poverty. God wants you free from poverty. Uh, Malachi 3.10, let's look at that. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me or literally prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. He didn't say that any other place in the Bible. Prove me or try me in this, in this in, with your money, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour out for you such a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I mean, you know, that's true then, it's true now. Yes. Absolutely. And then, second, I love 2 Corinthians 9 and 10. I love, that's a great verse. I got a little testimony for you. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply. Is that word in your Bible? <laughs> multiply? Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So God's just waiting on us. And I want to thank you for your generosity. You're very generous people. And uh, years ago, uh, Ida and I had just been married. And uh, in we were married in 1970. And then in 1971, we went up to hang out with my parents uh, in New Jersey, New Jersey. And uh, I remember we were so bored going up there. There was nothing to do. She and I were... Our blood pressure at the time was 90 over 70. I mean, we were working all the time, around the clock, you know? And so we were, and this is in New Orleans, we literally would go out for a walk and we would cry, you know, we're so bored. We love my parents. We love them. But we, we, we were so geared at that particular time. I mean, no, we needed to slow down a little bit. It was important that we slow down a little bit, right? You can get into a rut and not even know it, yep. right? So, 
Anyway, uh, Ina and my mom were cooking in the kitchen, and my dad said, uh, I asked my father, I said, Pop, how are you, how, how are things in the market? I had worked with my father, 1964, 65, on Wall Street. He was a very successful broker. And uh, I said, how are things going for you in the market? He says, not good. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. I said, can I ask you a question, Dad? I don't want to be a wise guy. But when did you stop tithing? He went, how did you know? I said, I didn't. Except because you have been a tither for all these years, God has blessed you. Phenomenal. And he had. And he said, I said, I'm a tither because of your testimony. I saw God move in your life and the life of my mom. Now I said, and then the Holy Spirit, that was a word of knowledge, and then the Holy Spirit gave me a word of wisdom. I said, can I give you a word of wisdom? And he said, yeah. <laughs> you know. He said, or I told him, I said, I'm going to tell you why you stopped. He said, yeah, I'd like to know why I stopped. I said, because you're in a dead church, that's why. All right? And I said, you're not being fed there. He went, my dad's very honest with me. He went, you know, I think you're really right. I think you're right. I think you put your finger on something. I said, look, there is a Presbyterian church close by, and they're evangelistic. They're on fire. I know the pastor. He's an awesome guy name is Don Pepper. Don Pepper was a wonderful man. Eventually he got his doctorate and we call him Dr. Pepper. You know. <laughs> Seriously, seriously that's, that's right. <laughs> but you know, I, we came back a year later and my dad was in that church. Dad and mom, they moved over there. They loved it. They were tithing again and God was blessing them financially with good market. So how many know it'll work for you? It'll work. Lean over and tell your neighbor it'll work for you. As you put him first. Amen, amen. Okay. All right, number four. Some people have actually stated that while they love the Lord, they did not love his word. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the word. Who, who, who is that? Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the what? Light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. Things haven't changed. All right, so Andrew Womack tells this story. It was just recent. He said he had a lady that had come to his Bible school. She got saved in his ministry, and then... Went to, this, went to the Bible school. She was a radical uh, pro-abortion person. And that didn't change for a long time until she was exposed to the word of God. And then she, was, then she changed her heart and her mind. And Andrew said, could I talk with you? He said, you know, there's been some radical changes taking place in your life. And he said, what was the issue? She said, the issue was this. She was very honest with me. The issue was, I love God, but I didn't love his word. How many know, I believe there are a lot of folks like that. Really, that's why we can't write people off. Can't write them off. Got to love them, you know. But there are a lot of people like that. And she had a radical change because she not only had fallen in love with what? With Jesus, but she now loved his word, right? So the more we love his word, the more the change will come in our lives, all right? Number five, we are not only to love people, but note what the Lord tells us, how we should respond to them. Tell them the truth. Lean over and tell your neighbor, you got to tell them the truth. <laughs> what if they don't like me? Well, they may not. 
But who do you love more? Uh, right? So, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. I got another story. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason with your neighbor, lest you bear sin because of him. In other words, we got to tell them the truth. All right? Come let us reason together. Let's talk this out. The thing you're doing is leading you to destruction. It's not working for you. Is it working for you? No, it isn't. There is a better way. Can I tell you how my life was changed? That's a good way to do it. You know, I love you too much to let you just go. Got to tell you the truth. Got to tell you the way it is. I had a, this is a really wild story. But I like wild stories. I'm in the library at Princeton Seminary. And uh, I don't know, I'm second year there or something. It's, uh, it was open till 10. It's 9.30. I've studied enough. I put my books, close the books. Put my head on the desk. I said, Lord, you got anything for me? He said, yeah. He said, yeah, go to the back of the library. There's two people talking. I want you to leave with them. Oh. Okay. I walk back, I walk back. I don't hear anything. You know, the enemy said, ah, that's just wild goose chase. Get to the very last study carol back there. And there's two guys, red-haired guy, blonde-haired guy. And they're talking in modulated tones. Well, I knew these guys. We had played flag football together. And so I, I went up to them. I said, what are you all talking about? One of them, they were talking about the, the Holy Spirit. Talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Neither of them had it. One of them was seemingly open to it. The other one was totally shut. So I knew who to go back with. The red-haired guy, right? So... We walk out of the library because it was closing, and I remember having a chance to really uh, try to talk with him and try to really reason with him on things. Some things he was open to to a degree. It would be like he would be open and then he'd be shut. He'd be open and be shut. And uh, he said to me, finally said to me, um, he got started getting mad. He started getting mad, and he just looked at me, and he said, if Paul were alive today, he'd thrash you. I said, I don't think he would. You'd like to, you know. And, but, we, but we stayed open. He stayed open uh, to, to me, and we kept talking about it, talking about it. And then he got baptized in the Holy Spirit, all right? He got filled, man. And uh, then, this is a wild story. He, he said, uh, Dave, I'm really excited because he said, this summer I'm going to Switzerland. He said, I'm in the Presbyterian choir. I'm going to go to Switzerland and sing. And uh, I went, hey, that's really cool. I said, I wish I could go with you. And uh, I said, well, see, I, I, have to, I need to talk to you. He said, yeah, what is it? I said, uh, I just got offered to take a youth group, a youth, young people's group in southern New Jersey, uh, not too far from the, where the seminary was. And uh, the Lord said, uh, it's a, it was a big youth group, and I would be with them for the summer and all that. And the Lord said, no, that's not for you. It's for Bob, the red-haired guy. And I told him that. The Holy Spirit told me. He said, well, see, I'm going to Switzerland. I'm thinking, yeah, and I want to go too, you know. <laughs> I said, look, buddy, all I can tell you is you pray about it. Will you pray about it? And then I'm off the hook. And he said, I, I promise I'll pray about it. A couple days later, he comes back. He said, I'm supposed to go to the, take the youth ministry down there. <laughs> Praise God. So I'm on my way to New Orleans for the first time. That's where the Holy Spirit directed me for the summer. 
we come back, we meet each other in the cafeteria there at the, at the seminary. He is on fire. He's saying, God is moving, man. Kids are getting filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm having a big rally tonight. Will you come with me? I said, sure. He said, uh, I met my wife, too. We're not. We're going to be married in a couple of months or whatever. And he said, he said I, I'm so glad I listened to what you had to say. So we get down there, and it was powerful, man. He was in a Methodist church bringing all this stuff. And he said, we can't pray for him down in the main hall or auditorium. He said, we have to send him to rooms, and then we're going to go into these rooms and lay hands on him. I don't know what the big deal was, but anyway, so we had about three or four pretty large rooms in the upstairs, and we would go from one room to the other laying hands on these kids. And it, it was a, a bust out. And Bob said, we're going to meet tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, on the football field. We're going to pray for a mighty move of God on the, on the campus here. And so I had about 50 kids there at 8 o'clock in the morning. We joined hands, worshiping God, praying, you know. But uh, you, you have to follow the Holy Spirit, right? Even if it goes against reason. Lean over and tell your neighbor, are you getting this? <clears throat> All right, so number six, last thing. As we purpose to be a witness for the Lord, and we are all called to be that way, all right, Jesus will give us boldness to speak for him and will confirm, that's the feeling, will confirm his word with signs following. Let's look over at uh, Mark 16, closing out. And he said to them, this is Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. Say, that's me. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They, uh, they, if they take uh, up serpents and if they uh, drink any deadly thing, it will not by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Not may, they shall. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. I love this part. The Lord working with them. And what? Confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. So wherever you go, even if you think it is impossible, one last illustration. My good friend Sam Hawkins uh, and I were asked by uh, Brother Green to go to Phoenix, Arizona. They were having a big conference there, uh, and it was all about Saturday soul saving, going out on Saturdays and uh, witnessing to people and stuff. And so Brother Green said, I want you to go there and bring back the material because we want to start doing that. I said, okay. So Sam and I went there, and uh, they asked both of us, they said, Okay, this is uh, the last day we're, uh, of the conference, and it was Saturday, and <coughs> excuse me. And they said, "What would you like to do? Would you rather um, go door to door, or would you rather street preach?" And I said, "Well, we've done a lot of door to door, so I vote for street street preaching." So they took us in the toughest part of Phoenix call it Skid Row. They had a halfway house down there to take care of people they would witness to down there that got saved. So they set us up with one of these street mics, right? And so we're down there. I mean, it, this is a tough area. So I'm standing there and I'm, I'm saying, Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to talk about here? And immediately he gave me John 10.10. 10. A thief comes but to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you what? Life and life more abundantly. So I said, okay. And, and the Lord said, you know, no, no. It's not just wing it. I'll, I'll help you. So I start preaching, you know. And I mean, people are, a lot of them are not happy with that. They're cussing me out and other things. 
But I noticed there was one guy who was, he was right across the street from me. Like, from Peter's city. He was standing, he was standing up. And I'm, I'm right here, and this guy's right there where Peter is. And so I said, well, I'm just going to preach to him. He's my congregation, congregation of one. And so I gave it, I just treated it like he's the only one I care about right now. Gave the word, ended it. And uh, the guy, he interrupts me, which is good, you know. And he says, you're talking about me? That's me, you're describing who I am. And uh, I said, do you want your life to change now? He said, yes, I do. I said, you ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I am. So I said, get over here. Come across. <laughs> the altar was the street, right? I said, just come across the street, man. I said, we're here for you. So the guy comes across the street. And uh, you, boy, I mean, the booze, you could just smell it, you know. And uh, anyway, he said the sinner's prayer right there. I told Sam, stand behind him. So Sam stands behind him. We laid hands on him. Pow! Holy Ghost lays him low. He's laying on the street, or on the sidewalk, you know. So uh, we just waited there with him. And then by that time, we started having some workers that were coming by to check on us from the church. And we said, this brother has just uh, given his heart to the Lord. And I said, he, obviously the Lord has started deliverance right now for him. So they said, well, we have a halfway house right over here. We will wait with you. And if he's open, then we'll take him right on over. I said, fine. So when he, when he came to himself, we helped him up. He was totally sober, <laughs> completely. And you couldn't even smell booze on him. And he said, we said, how did you get here? What happened? And he, he had been, a, a, I think, in the Navajo tribe or something. And then also he started in business. And he developed a, a really good business. And, uh, began to go up the ladder and started drinking. And uh, one thing led to another, and he wound up on the street. Lost his family, lost his wife, lost his kids. Just His life was literally being destroyed. And so he hugged us and loved us. He was crying, and we were too, you know. Wow. <laughs> and so he, he, went to, he went to the halfway house. This is, uh, oh, what was his name? Tommy... Tommy Barnett, great church there in Phoenix, Arizona. I think his son's ta is taking it over now. And uh, he said they, that we teach him, we get him sobered up, we help him get get their feet back in, in help, you know, work and things like that. And we make sure that they're established and we have we can bus them into the services and everything. I went, praise God. They're doing it, they're doing it, they're doing it. So, said all that to say this, that, um, Jesus will give us the boldness as we purpose to be a witness for the Lord Jesus will give us boldness to speak for him and th that's an amen to what I'm saying <laughs> and will confirm his word with signs following the word let's stand it doesn't matter how you feel <coughs> it doesn't matter about anything because I may know it's not about you or me all we have to do is just follow the Lord follow him and he will bring the changes but we have to be willing to follow him right how many are willing to follow him praise God listen it's an exciting life man right it's exciting <laughs>